Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. We're on Tuesday this week because this was a four-day weekend here in the United States, the Memorial Day weekend, and so I wanted to wait and see what the four-day box office totals were. It's a good thing because the final numbers were a little bit different from the estimates, but the one thing that remained consistent was that the expectations that the dual releases of A Quiet Place Part Two and Cruella uh, and the four-day holiday weekend and also the opening up of a lot of the theater chains, the hope that this would revive the box office has turned out to be founded because this show actually when I was looking through and going through the charts this feels like the first time in a very very long time that I'm actually doing the kind of chart show that I want to do that I've been wanting to do we have the return of the worldwide box office chart this week we're also just talking about success and we don't really have to qualify a whole lot of it there's a couple things here and there that we'll talk about but this is really feeling like getting back to the normal, getting back to the movies. And a lot of people did go back to the movies because this weekend, A Quiet Place Part Two was number one. Let's look first at the three-day total. So this is Friday through Sunday. This is usually what we look at on Mondays, but because of the holiday, there's a substantial amount of money of business, I should say, that was done on Monday. The number one movie was A Quiet Place Part Two. The three-day opening was $47.5 million. We'll look at that number, but that number alone qualifies it as the best Best opening of the pandemic era. Number two was Cruella with $21.4 million, despite the fact that Cruella was also available on Disney Plus Premier Access. We're going to break down those numbers in just a moment. At number three is Raya and the Last Dragon. Uh, it actually moved up. Spiral had overestimated a lot of its weekend numbers, and Raya and the Last Dragon was anywhere from fourth to fifth place in the estimated numbers for the weekend. It actually took third place in a very close race, followed by Spiral from the Book of Saw uh, at number four with $2.2 million. And just behind was Wrath of Man with $2.1 million. But when we look at the numbers for the four-day holiday weekend, there's a little bit of an adjustment. First of all, A uh, Quiet Place Part Part 2 jumps up about $10 million more, which is why I like to do these four-day uh, numbers, because that's much higher than you would usually get on a regular Monday. So for the four-day weekend, A Quiet Place Part 2, over $57 million. Cruella at $26.5 million. Raya and the Last Dragon stays there at 3 uh, but Wrath of Man over the four-day weekend actually did enough to take the four spot, edging out Spiral from the Book of Saw, which comes in number five for the four-day weekend. So really, of course, looking at that chart, the, the big news is A Quiet Place Part Two and how it did. And let's look at domestically. As I mentioned, just its three-day opening was enough for A Quiet Place Part Two to take the top spot for the biggest domestic opening weekend since theaters closed last year in 2020 and this is actually probably the last time we're going to see this chart because this is this is a bit of a page turn because with Cruella and with A Quiet Place Part 2 now all five highest opening weekends since theaters closed back in March of 2020 domestically are 2021 films so A Quiet Place Part 2 at number one followed by Godzilla vs. Kong with 31.6 million dollars over its first three days Mortal Kombat with 23.3 million Cruella uh, comes in at number four so we had the first and fourth highest openings uh, since the pandemic era began this weekend and then Demon Slayer the movie closes it out there at number five like I said this is kind of a symbolic turning of the page because now movies like Tenet and The Crude's A New Age, Wonder Woman 1984, I think now they officially belong to the pandemic era. And we will discuss them in terms of the pandemic, but their, their reality or their, their connection to movies that are currently in release is, is severed. We, we really are moving on to both the year 2021 box office-wise and this next era. What's going to be next for theatrical distribution? The market has changed completely now. The theatrical window looks like it's going to be cut in half for good. Some movies like Cruella are coming out at the same time. Is that going to continue? This is where we're firmly looking right now. We are looking at the future, and I think that this is officially the last weekend where we're going to be looking behind our shoulders at the past and those other movies. What is the legacy of a movie like Tenet going to be or Wonder Woman 1984, given all of the restrictions, given all of the different asterisks and discussion points about them? We don't know that yet, uh, but really now I know that my eye is fixed firmly, and I think most people's eyes are fixed firmly on the future. And one huge thing to think about when we're talking about the future is how distribution has changed and what's going to happen going on from here. Cruella is a movie that, as you probably know, 
took part of Disney's version of the new theatrical marketplace in that it was released in theaters and then on Disney Plus Premier Access at the same time, meaning you could go buy a ticket or you could watch it at home for a price of $30. And I wanted to crunch the numbers a little bit on this, and there was some data that was released from a company that we've talked about a few times here, Samba TV. They do market research and they purport to know how much uh, people have watched things at certain points at home. Now, I don't know Samba TV's methods, I, I, so I cannot vouch for the accuracy of this data just because I have not seen how this data is gathered, how reliable it is, etc. But I wanted to use this because this is the only kind of data we're going to get about something like Cruella uh, and how many households might have watched it because Disney is not going to release that, at least not anytime soon. So I wanted to use this to kind of show how the different models work and why you might see models like the Disney Premiere Plus more and more in the future. Samba put out a tweet saying that uh, by their metrics, 686,000 U.S. households stream Cruella on Disney Plus over the four-day Memorial Day weekend. They reported it to be 37% less than the number who streamed Mulan over later day, Labor Day weekend, although adding uh, ac accurately that Mulan did not get a theatrical release. So that's the number that Samba TV has released, 686,000. Again, I would like to stress that is not official data, and we and, and, and I don't know how accurate that data is. But here's how the numbers stack out, because some, some people might say like 686,000 people, that doesn't seem like a lot. Let's see how it stacks up versus how many people went to see it theatrically. So again, on my side, as it may be with Samba, these are all estimates. It's based on average ticket prices, etc. But this just goes to show you why this business model may be appealing for some people, especially Disney, going forward. So let's take that data and the data that we know about Cruella's open four-day weekend at the Memorial Day box office. Now, this is assuming that Disney gets a share, a 60% share of the theatrical gross. I think that is more than generous. If anything, we've heard that Disney is uh, negotiating for more of that theatrical gross. And also, we do know that Disney keeps 100% of the money that comes in from streaming because it's to their own service. So they're not splitting that money with anyone. So with the $26.5 million gross this weekend uh, at an average ticket price of $9.25, and when last reported, that was about the average ticket price here domestically, that, that averages out to about 2,864,864 .8, tickets sold. Obviously, that is not an exact number. That is an average based on an average. Uh, again, this is more of just a kind of an estimate of how something like this might look if you're sitting at Disney and you're, you're doing the numbers yourself. So if Disney keeps 60% of the opening weekend dollar, they keep $15,900,000 of that money that comes in. Of the $26.5 million, 40% uh, of that opening weekend goes to theaters, etc. Disney keeps $15.9 million. Now let's go to Samba's data. If 686,000 households streamed Cruella at $30 each, and that's how much it costs is $30 each, then that would have brought in $20,580,000 and Disney keeps 100% of that money. So if these numbers are accurate, and let's say for the, the purposes of this experiment that they are, Disney likely grossed more money, $20,580,000, from the 686,000 households who streamed Cruella and paid the $30 than they did from the 2.8 million people, almost 2.9 million people, who bought tickets because that brought in 15.9 million dollars. Now, this is not the final word on, well, see, streaming is a better business model. There are a lot of intangibles. We don't know the size of the Disney Plus market, how many people are willing to pay $30 to watch a movie. We've seen it was fewer people than were willing to pay for Mulan, probably because they could go see it in a theater because that was an option. We don't know what the interest uh, was for the audience. Uh, you know, critical reactions certainly seemed to be more positive. Audience reactions seemed to be more positive. There are a lot of X factors here, uh, plus the fact that a, a billion dollar gross, which Disney has shown that they are capable of doing over and over again, um, well, that would that bring more money on a movie like Black Widow than offering it at home? Disney will find that out later this summer because Black Widow will also be available for $30 for people to watch at home. I think what's important is that the Disney model, and this is a Disney model specifically, it's not like HBO Max where you're a subscriber to the service and you get the movie for free. Whether people have Disney Plus or don't have Disney Plus, you're paying $30 to see this movie. So if that number 686,000 is accurate, that means that all of those households paid to watch Cruella and they paid extra to watch Cruella because that's what Disney's business model is. I think that's part of the reason why if we see Disney continuing with this business model, it may be that their risk assessment or whatever they do says that like, 
hey, we may be shaving people off the theatrical experience here, but you know, we have a wide margin here where if we lose X amount of people theatrically, but we gain X amount of people streaming, we're actually going to end up making more money. Now, that doesn't do anything for the theater owners, obviously, and it brings up some interesting questions if you're a talent involved with the film, uh, but it just goes to show you the different kinds of calculations that are being done, because even though over three times as many people reportedly went to the movies to see Cruella, or at least tickets sold, uh, a third uh, of that number of people uh, potentially generated more money. So that's one of the interesting things to look at as the business changes, is how do each of these companies evolve? Paramount is doing it by shortening the theatrical window to 45 days and uh, keeping things only in theaters. Warner, we've seen uh, this year, is experimenting with a with a dual release on HBO Max and theatrical. Although it looks like that's going to go away. Disney now with the paid version versus the theatrical version. There are so many different models floating out there. It's going to be interesting to see which one comes out on top. But the domestic box office wasn't the only story going this weekend. As a matter of fact, I'm very happy to bring this chart back because it was a fixture on the previous version of the show that I did over on Fandom Entertainment. But the numbers stopped being reported when everything closed down worldwide. And this is the first weekend I could actually go back to Comscore, which is the company that reports these numbers. And it helps me because it's one reliable source. Uh, and I can officially report the top five movies worldwide. So this, these are movies in worldwide release. And number one was A Quiet Place Part Two. Worldwide, it made over $70.3 million in, in several markets. Obviously, a big opening here domestically in North America. It also had an opening in China this past weekend uh, for a net total worldwide of $70.3 million. Cruella, $37.4 million. Again, the bulk of that coming from its release here uh, domestically in North America. F9, in its second weekend uh, in several markets, the biggest one being China, drops to $30.8 million. And this is a, actually a very interesting story. Now, we're going to cover parts of it on the live show. I didn't do my live show last week because I was on the road. I was visiting Los Angeles with Mara. I got to see so many great friends and had intended to do it, but just technically could not figure out the way to do that. Uh, but part of that is this controversy that erupted with John Cena, where John Cena said in an interview that uh, Taiwan was the first country that's going to get to see F9. That is a very sticky subject in China, and John Cena issued an apology for those comments. I have a lot to say about that topic. Uh, this is not the show to say those uh, thoughts on anymore. That that will be the live show. I, I think that's a very bad precedent, uh, but there's some question about would that hurt F9's theatrical prospects. But the other big thing, and I mentioned this last week on the show, was that reviews for F9 in China weren't great. Uh, they, they were not very enthusiastic reviews. Well, this weekend, it dropped 85% in China in its second weekend. We've said this before. You see this a lot in China. You have a huge opening number and then the bottom falls out. Um, that happens with movies sometimes that have good reviews, uh, but it happens much more often with movies that don't have good reviews. The word of mouth has been very bad. This is a big story because F9 has this huge opening in China, but the bottom has fallen out here. This puts more pressure, I think, on the movie domestically because now you don't have that cushion that you had with the last film. And if the reviews are similar here, and, and I know that there are some reviews that are out, I've been trying to figure out when I can see it. I, I don't have uh, any hard data on that yet. I will see it and review it uh, as early as I possibly can, even if that's the night before on Thursday and go to see the previews, that's when it's going to be. But if the reviews aren't good, if, if, if you actually do see a, a continued lack of enthusiasm uh, for the franchise here, then we could be in some dire straits. Uh, if you're Universal looking at this franchise, this is kind of their banner franchise, this one in Jurassic World, and we've got another one of those movies on the way. What is going to happen? Are they just going to be the house of the minions? This is going to be very interesting to watch, uh, and especially because the timing with China opening so much earlier than it's opening here in North America. A uh, very interesting story to watch with F9 as we approach its release date, still a few weeks away here in North America. Let's look at what the 2021 worldwide box office looks like to date. Uh, so just for this year, Hi Mom is number one, $841 million. Detective Chinatown 3 at two, Godzilla vs. Kong at three, F9 at four, and Cliff Walkers at five. That hasn't changed. A Writer's Odyssey and Sisters still at six and seven. Raya and the Last Dragon, which as we mentioned, has, has had a resurgence or at least has been hanging around more than any of the other uh, box office movies that came out around the same time is now, it says new, it's because it dropped off the chart it's now back on the chart at number eight that's helped uh, push its numbers up Endgame is at number nine tom and jerry is at number 10 
uh, a movie called My Love has dropped out of the top 10. A, a caveat on this, though, this has been a, a bear of a chart to try to maintain because I have three or four different sources that I look at. Usually they're kind of close together. Uh, this one is all over the place. There's movies that have way more on this chart and way less on this chart and way less on that. So, uh, you know, you may see that change, especially as you get down to the lower part of that chart and those numbers are so close together. As time goes on and movies start pulling away, it's going to be a little bit easier to manage. But when you look at other sources, you may see other movies in different positions or maybe one that's dropped off my chart is at number 10 on a different chart. It's just because it is so hard to get all of the data together in one place. You know, I have my combination of sources. Other people have theirs. Uh, but that's just a note if you're looking at the 2021 worldwide box office. Returning domestically to the weekend here, let's look at the movie that got the top per theater for the weekend. And this is actually one that uh, my sources haven't updated yet, but I was looking at the reports on the specialty box office, and it looks like this is going to be the film that takes the per theater average. It is a Vietnamese film called uh, Bo Gia, or transferred to uh, Dad, I'm Sorry. It was opened in about 20 theaters at $17,500 per theater. That edges it out over A Quiet Place Part 2. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the final numbers to see if that is the reported per theater average winner. This is another sign of a recovering box office, the fact that you have a film um, uh, of this nature. It's from, like I mentioned, it's from Vietnam. Um, a, a very, very popular uh, online uh, presence uh, for this movie and, and for this uh, franchise, uh, if you will. And a movie that performed well in metropolitan areas, which is something we often see on the top per theater average. So this is something else I like to see, a per theater gross like this for a movie in a small number of theaters. That means people are starting to go back out to theaters, even if it isn't for the big Blockbusters, another great sign uh, of an ongoing recovery. Looking at the 2021 domestic box office so far, Godzilla vs. Kong is still number one. This big debut for A Quiet Place Part 2, it enters the chart at number two. Raya and the Last Dragon is at number three. Demon Slayer the movie at four, followed closely by Tom and Jerry at number five. They've swapped places this week. Mortal Kombat is at number six. Cruella jumps onto the chart domestically at number seven, followed by Nobody, Wrath of Man, and Spiral from the Book of Saw. They both drop down two spots. The Marksman and the Little Thing, both get bumped from the 2021 chart. And let's go even closer, not just to the year 2021, but to the summer box office chart. Remember, I put out my predictions earlier, just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, we are now getting into the heart of it. I did pick Quiet Place Part 2 to be on my top 10 list. I did not pick Cruella to be on my list. We'll see if that has uh, any impact uh, moving forward. Uh, but right now, A Quiet Place Part 2 is the number one movie of the summer with $57 million. But Cruella is the number two movie of the summer at $26.5 million. Wrath of Man is at number three. Spiral from the Book of Saw is at number four. Those Who Wish Me Dead at number five. Here Today and Finding You, two smaller movies at six and seven. Dream Horse, a new movie at number eight. Profile at nine. The re-release of Scoob at 10. We're going to start sloughing off those last probably five through 10 very soon because those grosses are not going to stand up to the bigger movies that are coming out, even if they're not destined to be some of the biggest movies of the summer box office. So we're going to see some more recognizable names there in the top 10. And probably once we hit July is when we're really going to start separating, like how does Cruella do compared to In the Heights or a lot of these other films? And we'll get a much better look at how these are going to shake out as we go deeper into the summer. And finally, looking at 2021, this is one of my favorite. It's actually looking at 2020 and 2021. One of my favorite new charts. We're looking at the top 10 of the last 365 days. So the last year from this date, June the 1st last year to June the 1st this year, what have the top 10 movies been? And Godzilla vs. Kong is still number one. In 63 days of release, The Crude's A New Age at number two, Tenet at number three with 57.929. But look at A Quiet Place Part Two. In just four days of release, it is already number four. And the fact that it's only about $900,000 behind Tenet, the reality of it is, as we sit here right now, a Quiet Place Part Two has almost certainly passed Tenet uh, and sold over a million dollars since yesterday. So that is going to be the number three movie looking at it next week. Tenet's going to fall down to number four. Raya and the Last Dragon at number five. Demon Slayer the movie jumps up a spot to number six. It's actually now, according to my sources and looking at my numbers, it is now outgrossed Wonder Woman 1984 at the domestic box office. Tom and Jerry is at number eight. Mortal Kombat at number nine. Cruella enters the list. It's now one of the 10 highest grossing films of the previous 365 days at number 10. And then 
then dropping out was the movie that had been on this chart the longest. The New Mutants, this is its 278th day after release. It is now off the chart. Nobody is also removed from the chart after 68 days, but The New Mutants was the movie that had been on this list the longest. I've told you that we're going to start a club called the 365 Club, and that's any movie that can actually stay on this chart for 365 consecutive days. We're going to get them. There's going to be some movies that come out, probably one or two this summer, maybe. We'll see how they do that can do it. But the closest that we had was New Mutants. Now Tenet is the senior member of this chart with 272 days. So uh, a little under 100 days left uh, for it to make that 365. Will that $57.9 million gross hold up? Can it make it basically through the end of the summer without having um, eight more movies outgross it? I don't know. We will see, but Tenet is now hanging on. It's the old man on the chart. A Quiet Place will be moving up, and uh, this is fun to track. It's just fun to see what movies uh, we're seeing over the course of a year, looking at it a different way, and that's really what the show is about. It's it's about not just looking at the numbers on their surface, looking at numbers a different way, trying to put things in the context. This is a new way to do it. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying this chart, and uh, we're going to keep making it. There were a couple of big pieces of news that came out today. Uh, We're talking about recovery that regard to two theater chains that just a few months ago were regarded as being in big trouble. One of them is AMC. AMC Theaters, at one point, people thought, what if they filed for bankruptcy? Then Reddit stepped in, saved them from a lot of that talk, and now they are looking at expanding because today AMC announced that they have sold $230 million worth of stock to a firm called Mudrick Capital and that they are going to use that stock largely for acquisitions and expansions. So we've gone from from a, a talk of bankruptcy to a talk of expansion. One of the things that they are looking at perhaps expanding to uh, would be the former Arclight Theaters in Los Angeles. That's also where the Cinerama Dome is and the Pacific Theaters in Los Angeles, including one of the big movie going hubs in LA, which would be the Grove. And this would give AMC essentially a stranglehold on the movie going business in Los Angeles because the Grove and the Arclight were two of the only big, big ticket places that you could go that were not controlled by AMC. You have wonderful uh, independent theaters located all throughout Los Angeles, including my favorite in the city, the Vista. There's the Los Feliz 3, which was near the Arclight. They don't offer necessarily all the creature comforts, but they are independently owned. A lot of times they would play smaller movies, movies you wouldn't find at the bigger chains. But if the Arclight and the Grove were both to fall under AMC, they would essentially have the biggest theaters all across the city from the west side uh, all the way through Hollywood. And I, you know, I have very mixed feelings on this because I loved Arclight theaters. And one of the things that I loved about Arclight is that, yes, you had some of the same problems that you have at other movies, but it actually did seem to have an ownership and a staff that did care about the theatrical experience. They were committed to offering a premium experience. They made their employees, in my opinion, a lot more available if you had a problem, if you had a problem with the picture or the sound, if you had a problem with somebody in the theater. It seemed like they genuinely cared and they would play a lot of these smaller movies, even though they were more premier theater. Uh, and I and I worry that you know AMC is the biggest fish in the sea right now. And 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 I worry that if you just throw that under the AMC banner, then it just becomes another AMC theater. And one of the things that I loved about the ArcLight and then the Cinerama Dome, which is a very, very special place uh, for movie lovers, for movie goers, is that it didn't feel like just another theater. The Pacific Theaters at the Grove, to me, it, it did feel like that. It did nothing wrong. Uh, I, I liked their theater, but it, it did feel like just another movie theater. The Arclight has always felt special. And so, I, obviously, I would love someone to go in and buy the Arclight and the Cinerama Dome to keep it going. But I hope that whomever it is, if it's AMC, I would hope that they understand the legacy of that theater and what they offered the citizens of Los Angeles, which is more than just a screen and a place to go see movies. They offered it an experience. They hosted Q&As. They hosted special events. I hope that continues because I would hate for to just throw a, a, a coat of paint over what was once the Arclight uh, and make it just another theater because I think you're going to lose a lot of the people that went to that Arclight because it was just that much more. So we'll see what happens with AMC, but they're obviously well on the way to recovery now with a, an eye on expansion. And then speaking of expansion, another chain that actually 
did go into bankruptcy. We talked about it on the show a few months ago. Alamo Draft House, they fired for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, but they had a plan in place already uh, for who they were going to sell it to. They have now come out of bankruptcy, so they've officially emerged uh, under their new organization with their new owners, and they've announced plans to open five new theaters, one in Manhattan, one on Staten Island, uh, one in St. Louis, and two in Washington, D.C. So they're coming out as well uh, out of financial difficulty, uh, not playing it safe, opening up new theaters, new chains. According to the press release I read today, uh, the Los Angeles Alamo Theater sold out every showing uh, of every movie that they had this past weekend. Now, again, that's largely because there are uh, still restrictions in place. I went to see Quiet Place Part 2 actually in Los Angeles while Mara and I were there, and the theater, while I think technically sold out or close to it, uh, there were a lot of empty seats because they're keeping the social distancing guidelines in place, although the theater changed did announce this past week that that they are dropping the mask requirement for vaccinated patrons. So we may see a relaxing of those guidelines if case numbers remain low. So a sold out theater doesn't necessarily mean a packed theater, but it does seem like the demand is there. And now we have big theater chains that are saying we are going to up the supply. We're going to keep new theaters opening because we want to make sure that people have a movie theater to go to. Whether that's going to turn out to be a good thing or a bad thing, and like I said, my my, my case with the Arclight, I'm still not quite sure how I feel about that. We will see, but uh, this is just a big week for news about the resurgence of the movie-going industry. Let's hope that the summer stays on track. Well, we were looking at the future. Now let's look at the past. This was Memorial Day weekend back in 1993. This is the four-day weekend, and it was actually the same exact date range. It was May 28th through May 31st of 1993, and the number one film of the week was Sylvester Stallone's Cliffhanger, I think one of the finest action films of the 1990s. In its first week, $20.4 million, that's pretty good in 1993 money, made in America the Ted Dance and Whoopi Goldberg movie. I I don't know if many other people remember this. I do because it came out when I was a kid. It also in its first week made $11.8 million. At number three, a Kevin Klein Sigourney Weaver comedy named Dave. If you haven't seen Dave, I actually think it's pretty good. Uh, I like that movie a lot. It's about a guy who happens to look just like the president who steps in to become the president or pose as the president. I think it's a cute little movie. Check it out if you haven't seen it. At number four, oh, one of the biggest whiffs of the 1990s. This should have been a huge movie, but it came out way too late and wasn't even close to the source material. Even the kids weren't fooled in its first week. Super Mario Brothers starring Bob Hoskins and John Leguizamo should have been, I think in a lot of people's estimations, the number one movie, but it was god awful. I remember seeing it when I was a kid and I thought it sucked back then. $8.5 $8.5 million. I have no nostalgia for that movie whatsoever. And then in its second week, Hot Shots Part 2 almost took down Super Mario Brothers. I'm an easy mark for a good parody film, a good spoof film. I think that Hot Shots is one of those. Uh, again, if you haven't seen Hot Shots, well, you know, it parodies a lot of stuff from the 90s, so it, it might have lost a lot of its relevance. I'm sure it has, uh, but it's still a movie that makes me laugh a lot. Before we go, as always, I want to check out also what people are watching at home, even though they're returning to theaters. I think we're still going to keep this up because it's interesting to see what people are choosing to buy or rent uh, in their homes. And let's start off with Amazon. At number one is Wrath of Man, which is still in the top five. It is part of that deal. Uh, The Universal Films, after a certain amount of time, a month or less, they can go to premium video on demand. It was the number one premium video on demand movie this past weekend. So that's pretty impressive that it was pulling in people on PVOD and also at the box office a quiet place you're gonna see it a few places Uh, i think this is just really interesting the way that amazon maps out their data so the hd rental of a quiet place is there at number two Godzilla vs. Kong, which is available to purchase for $30, is at number three. A Quiet Place in standard definition was at number four. So A Quiet Place taking two of the top four spots on the Amazon rentals chart. Nobody is still in the top five as a premium video on demand title. Spiral from the Book of Saw making its debut as a premium video on demand title was at number six. Chaos Walking, uh, the rental window opened on that movie. So that's there at number seven. And then at number eight, the 4K rental for A Quiet Place. So three of the top 10 spots belong to A quiet place a lot of people revisiting that movie in anticipation of the second one or maybe after watching the second one john wick chapter three is at number nine and then at number 10 saving private ryan my suspicion is that's probably linked to the memorial day weekend here in the united states a pretty good movie if you're going to watch one Uh, i think that's one of my favorite war movies one of my favorite spielberg movies of all time Let's look now what people were watching through Apple and iTunes. And at number one, Wrath of Man, premium video on demand, bringing people in at number one. And then look at that, number two on the iTunes chart. Now, they don't break it down versus buying and renting in different formats, but A Quiet Place was number
number two there. The Dry, The Marksman, and Chaos Walking remain uh, in the top 10 there at three, four, and five. Raya and the Last Dragon and Minari at six and seven. Lone Survivor, I think another movie probably tied to the Memorial Day weekend at number eight. Nobody enters the chart, re-enters the chart as a premium video on-demand title at number nine. Godzilla vs. Kong is a purchase at number 10. Spiral from the Book of Saw was available on uh, Apple and iTunes devices uh, as a premium video on-demand title. It did not, or at least when I looked at the chart, was not in the top 10. So I think that says something about probably the lack of enthusiasm, at least for people to lay out the money, the 20 bucks to rent this at home, uh, not on the top 10 uh, for Apple. Let's look at what people are watching on Netflix at number one. The Netflix series, I believe they picked this up from another network. Lucifer, some new episodes available, is at number one. Dog Gone Trouble, a Netflix original movie, is at number two. Home at number three. And the Netflix original movie, Blue Miracle, at number four. Army of the Dead is at number five. Dirty John, Betty Broderick, a follow-up to the uh, big hit series starring Connie Britton and uh, Eric Bana that I actually quite enjoyed. Uh, Those episodes became available on Netflix, and that's there at number six. The Netflix series Ragnarok is at number seven. New episodes of The Kaminsky Method at number eight. At number nine... Coco Melon. I'm telling you, this is going to be there till the end of time. Uh, I, I need to go back and look at how many weeks Coco Melon has been on this chart, but it is still there at number nine. And at number 10, the Netflix series Who Killed Sarah? And then finally, let's look at the top 10 movies that Netflix users are choosing to watch. Uh, Carried over from the overall top 10, Dog Gone Trouble, Home, Blue Miracle, and Army of the Dead. The Mitchells vs. the Machines is at number 5. Collateral Beauty, starring Will Smith, for some reason is at number 6. That's one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen, but Spencer Gilbert wrote a great theme song for it uh, back when we were at Screen Junkies. The Woman in the Window, uh, falling quickly to number 7. That's a Netflix original that is not keeping pace with the others that came out right around the time it came out and then the secret life of pets 2 sabotage starring arnold schwarzenegger and madagascar 3 europe's most wanted rounding out that top 10 and that wraps up my look at the box office for this week but we do not stop there is a a big release pretty much every single week either in theaters or at home for the rest of the summer so this upcoming weekend we have the opening of the conjuring the devil made me do it which will be available in theaters and for people that have hbo max and spirit untamed which is a dreamworks reunion with one of their earliest animated films also opening in theaters nationwide we're going to keep tracking this stuff as the summer goes on we got a big june a big july a big August, honestly. A lot of stuff stacked up. I'm excited to see all of it. I will bring you reviews of it as soon as I'm able to get it. I don't have anything for The Conjuring 3 right now. Looks like that might be a movie that I watch Thursday night in the theater, but I will get you a review as soon as I'm able to see it. Thank you so much for watching the show. If you want to see even more of what I'm up to, you can check me out on Patreon at patreon.com slash Dan Merle. We are resetting everything. We're about to choose this month's movie club theme. There's still time for you to get in on that. Also, for all patrons, no matter what level, I do recaps of all my movie trivia schmodown matches. There is a monthly movie commentary and a watch along that everyone gets access to. We have a lot of fun over on Patreon. I'd love to have you join us. Also, don't forget about my podcast, All My Movies. A new episode will be dropping tomorrow. We're going to be taking on one of the best action movies of the 1990s speed our second Jan de Bont title in uh, just under a month probably the last one we'll do on the show uh, but I'm excited to talk about it and everything else that we're doing here thank you so much for watching stay safe out there and I'll see you next time bye <laughs>